Away you go. Hello, welcome back. If you've been here before, this is Donna Balzer, Facebook Live. You've come to the right place. I'm a horticulturist, author, and speaker, and I love gardening. So if you love gardening, I'm glad you came over. I'm the author of this book. This is the three-year gardener's gratitude journal. And when you have a closer look, you can see what a mess. I've written in every page. Something's happening. A good thing it's a three-year journal, so I have just one year filled out and a couple years to go. I'm joined today by Ian. Ian is my producer. There's his hand. I hope you're only seeing his hand. Sometimes he puts a knee or something into the Or an elbow or some shaggy <laughs> hair. You might even see a little bit of my glasses. I'm a, here. I'm a little bit distracting, but he is going to prompt me if I forget something. I'll do. I've got your back. Which happens. Because it is hot today. It's a hot day. I was just thinking this morning how great it's it is. Smoking hot out there. We live in Canada because it's cool in the mornings and in the evenings. But it's really hot already in midday. So good time to come indoors. If you've been out gardening, good time for me to get indoors and cool off. I actually had sweat dripping off my uh, nose <laughs> this morning. I don't, I don't, I don't, okay, everybody says they don't sweat. But really, I don't sweat. And I had, um, you know, drips coming off my face. So enough about me. I'm Donna, and I'm all about gardening, so thanks for joining me. Yeah, so, uh, well, let's tell uh, everybody a little bit about Donna and her gardening, because you're on TV a lot, and you're on the radio a lot. I know, I've got lots of stuff coming up, exactly. This weekend coming up, I'm going to be on Global TV in Calgary. I'm talking about kids in the garden, but I'm also talking about how to know when that cauliflower is ready, because you can go from perfect to past, and sometimes one day or as little as half a day. So we're talking about that this weekend. Is that the yellow ones that you've been posting on your Facebook page? Yeah, they're orange. Flame starter. Or it's a new type. The orange. I know. I used to grow cheddar, which was the orange one, because I realized we used to eat. And this personal question, do you eat orange cheddar or white cheddar? Um, both. Yeah. We used to eat only orange cheddar. And I realized over the years it's drifted to we eat only white cheddar. And mm -hmm. so when you make white sauce on white cauliflower, not as pretty, but when you put it on orange cauliflower, quite fun. So, yeah. But uh, I noticed that some people say they have trouble growing cauliflower. Is it a difficult vegetable to grow? It is a difficult vegetable to grow because it prefers cool weather. It's sort of a spring plant. You start it early, you put it out early, you baby it, you cover it if it gets too hot to like cover it with shade it a bit or you put it in a shadier spot. It doesn't like to have, for instance, this spring, remember little jobs in the garden? We harvested one yes, of the cauliflowers beautiful... that had come all winter. So yeah. I think it would be too cold, but that's just about perfect conditions for cauliflower. So people do have troubles, especially if they plant them too late. If they do that May 24th planting, forget about it. By <laughs> May 24th, honestly, it's too late to start planting cauliflower. They need to be in early. They need to be in often. So I just this, week actually just this week i planted more cauliflower hoping it'll bridge me through to the fall season so cauliflower is tough but we'll talk about that more with bindu suri uh, she is the producer and the host of global tv on the weekends and your daughter was with uh, her talking about berries and predator beneficial bugs how, yeah. how does that work all? yeah she um she was there this weekend actually she was uh, you know if you're going to go once, family may as well go twice because we are both, Chelsea and I, co-authors of the Gardener's Gratitude Journal. So she was on this weekend and I'm on next weekend. So she brought in a whole selection of fruits that are amazingly ready on prairies. And the prairies, you know, it's tricky in the summer getting enough food, but she's got raspberries and cherries and choke cherries and house caps. So Saskatoon's, it's just all peaking right now in Alberta and throughout the prairies. It's awesome. And speaking of appearances, this Friday with Cheryl? No, no? this Friday is- Oh, it's not Cheryl. No, it's uh, Kathleen, Catherine Morrow. Uh, Judy Aldous is my normal host on um, Alberta at noon, and that's happening live this Friday. Again, live, it's so exciting, 12.30. So you come in or come on to your phones in Alberta at 12.30. And I think right now it's the same time in Saskatchewan. So you can get us online. They like tweets. They like emails. They like personal phone calls. So call us between 1230 and 1 this Friday. And that is also kind of a phone in like this uh, like this Facebook Live, but it's on, on CBC Radio. I got it. So I wrote in here, like North by head. Northwest Saturdays with Cheryl McKay. That's not exactly, it's, it's not. What's it's, with you? I know it's a mistake, but it's still good for people to know that you're on the CBC and BC too. 
So it's good. It's okay, still good information. It's just incorrect information for this Saturday. Thanks, Ian. It's Alberta, and I'll hide it. See, I just hide. I just okay. hit it. Alberta at noon this Friday. But if you do want to hear that Cheryl McKay interview, you can actually go onto my daughterbalzer.com. And I've just posted that as a separate blog post because I was talking about, you know, that really gross problem when it looks like you have barf in your garden. Oh, yeah, yeah. Spit. Yeah, you don't. So we did that interview and that is posted and you can find that right now on my blog. I've got a link to it. So all good to go. DonnaFalzer.com. Oh, actually, you know what? There you go. I've showed it. Oh, there you go. I presented it. I'm back. I've You're got my game back. Ah, <laughs> good, Ian. Ian's warm too. He's he's having trouble here today. So anyway, lots of me. I do. I've got allergies this week. Um, is it the pollen? My face is really. I don't know of any pollen this week. Really? Could be. Hmm. I don't well, know. Do a pollen test. You know, my sister used to live in Phoenix, and they would um, announce the pollen numbers every morning. Oh, really? So people would know if they should go outside. Uh, yeah. Well, I feel very polleny. <laughs> so this Friday, phone in. Sorry, sorry to laugh. I'm feeling a little under the weather myself. Oh. So, okay. Well, um, last week you and I we uh, dug up your garlic. We did. And there was because a bunch of my questions. My garlic was ready. Not everyone's garlic is ready. Well, that's well. It's interesting enough. Uh, Marion Elisalde says, "How does one know when to harvest garlic?" It's mm -hmm. a good question. Mm -hmm. So, how do you know? Well. I was talking to some folks in Cranbrook and I was there a couple of weeks ago and they were saying a garlic producer told them if they didn't remove their scapes, they would eventually straighten out and then they would know the garlic was ready. That's an easy test. But well, what about for someone idea. like me that uses the scapes for cooking? Well, you've already removed them. It's too late for them to stand out. So what you do is you look at the leaves. When the bottom half of the leaves have started to turn brown, that means it's probably time to harvest your garlic. It doesn't matter if it's the 1st of July or the 1st of September. You have to wait because different areas are rainy. And when it rains a lot, those leaves might stay green longer, which means the bulbs are fattening up and getting bigger and bigger. So the longer you can keep your leaves green, really the better you are. But mine are in the front yard. I didn't water them. We went through a heat wave. They were brown at least half. So then you do the test, you get out with your garden fork. You never try to just pull it out because if it's overripe, you'll lose a lot of cloves in the soil, they'll throw it next year. So you go in with your garden fork. We're going to do a little job in the garden on this, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay, so watch again this Wednesday. This Wednesday we're we'll going to be post doing... how to dig your garlic. But meanwhile, if you're doing it today, you just get in and ease some up and check to make sure that they are dry. Don't wash them, just rub off the actual cloves with your fingers and see if they're dry. Should be all good. As long as those half, of, at least half the leaves are brown, your garlic is probably ready to go. If you dig it too late, the cloves start to separate apart like a little rose opening up. And once they're too late, they don't store as long. So it's better to do it just at the right time, not too fast, not too late, just in the middle. So if you've got some brown leaves, go out and test dig today. That's excellent advice, and I'm not just saying that. Rebecca Rose, <laughs> well, no, Rebecca, she says, uh, my garlic looks like it's ready to be harvest, uh, harvested. More than half the leaves have started to turn yellow-brown, which is exactly what you just mm -hmm. said, but the cloves are teeny tiny. Is it too early, or perhaps I just need to focus more on improving the quality of my, I don't know what this word is, A-O-I-O-L. Aioli. For next year, what are your hot tips for yielding <laughs> bigger heads of garlic? Well, to get the bigger heads, honestly, uh, Rebecca, you have to be watering it quite a bit between the time when it comes up in the spring and when it's ready to harvest. And as I was just saying, if you were able to keep it green longer, you will get bigger cloves. The trouble is if you don't have a watering system set up. Last year, I had the best garlic ever. I had a, a, a watering system. I had a little line that ran out just to that row of garlic, and we had it on a timer. And that was delightful. But I moved that timer into my greenhouse, and that's pretty useful there, too. So I may have to buy a second timer. The okay. longer you can keep the garlic green, and for some people that aren't ready to harvest yet, just keep this in mind. The longer you keep it green, the bigger that garlic will get. That's good advice. I have to say I'm impressed. I like it when you <laughs> – well, no, I love it when you you surprise me. Uh. I don't know why, but – it's like oh Ian, you, you, i'm a horticulturist and author i know <laughs> i know i know i know that i know that i work for you oh. um patty stevens um she's a new gardener she says two of my clematis am i saying that word right is it clematis clematis, clematis. i just say clematis i mean okay clematis 
is the, the pronunciation of the man's name that it's named after. So the really hardcore gardeners say Clematis. But Clematis, we all know what you're talking about. It's fine. Okay, so Patty says, two of my Clematis or Clematis vines are dying from the ground up. They are three-year-old plants that have flourished every year. One of them withered before it bloomed. The second one was blooming, but now it's dying off. They are in a south-facing bed with afternoon shade from the garage. They also have companion plants shading their roots in lower part of the plant. So she's covered off. She's got it all figured out. What's going on? She's got it all covered. What I need to know is... She's, she thinks, she's wondering if it was ants. Ants? No, know. well, it, well, it could be. Ants can become a real problem in the garden, and I actually have a solution for that. Let's remember to talk about that. Okay. Today or in a minute. For, but sure. I want to address her first, because, Patty, I think if those leaves are browning and curling, you may have a fungus disease, and that is a problem. There's also a problem called bacterial blight, which, which is a bacterial oh. disease, which gets into clematis. If you've got that, you are in trouble. You won't be able to grow clematis in that spot again. But I'm hoping it just dried out. I'm hoping something went wrong. You're saying it's in good sun with just afternoon shade, but it has been a dry season. I'm not sure from your text here where you live, but if you're still listening, Patty, if you're online right now, let us know where you're from. And look, Sean Marie's also says, she said, my clematis is looking terrible. I think it has a fungal issue too, or oh, an iron deficiency. Well, so. Maybe, Sean, you can get out and take a picture of it because if the older <laughs> leaves are brown and they're starting to curl a bit that's probably bacterial blight that's terrible but could be as i was just saying to patty she might have just been in a spot where there was just a really warm um, spell um you were just asking about iron sean and if, if you think it's iron the iron's almost on the newest growth so you start to see it working top to bottom and patty said her bottom up and that's kind of distinctive because from the bottom up, it could just be dead roots, could be drought or too much water, or she could have this bacterial blight. So let's get some more pictures going and then we'll know more. Okay, that's great. Um, also want to say a big shout out to Bev. Bev Duke is with us and she says, she just wants to go back to the- uh, oh, Right, Bev had been writing us about- Well, she wants to say, just made, made a comment about the garlic. She just said, right. uh, I've heard that the size is really dependent on the quality of the seeds slash cloves you plant. There is, is something to that, Bev, uh, as to what gardeners do, because they're not, uh, garlics are very interesting. They are usually collected and shared among gardeners, so they're not changing the way that seed started plants can be changed, but they do still have a slight bit of evolution, if you might call it that. So I do try to plant my biggest ones and encourage a bigger crop later, but if you, if they dry out it doesn't matter how big they were initially they really they're critical to get water during those last at least the last 30 days of their growth very critical to get water some people think they're they're finished now anyway i'm just gonna let them dry out but you can change that size quite a bit in that last month so i'd like to know how much garlic you're growing babe that sounds interesting yeah that's awesome thanks mm -hmm. for your comment babe um okay so i guess we're in midsummer and everyone's started, started starting to talk about the fall <laughs> yeah, it's true. Miriam Turner. Gardeners, they were so short, short, trendy. Oh, she started wanting to start her fall and winter veggies. Yes. Yeah. Is this the time when you start thinking about that? Didn't I just give you some peas last week? You did. Oh, yeah. I did. I planted them. I don't know if they're growing or not. <laughs> you know, I started some peas. I started some onions. Did I show you my onions? I've no. got some little green onions that I just direct seeded last week. Little green ones that are going to be... um. A long, they're called the long-standing Nebuco. It was a new type to me. But I was tired of not ever having, I always seem to run out of green onions. We just picked them all. So I started some more last week. But it's also a good time to start all of your cabbages and cauliflowers if you have a long enough season that you can grow into November. And that's getting to be the case almost everywhere. I know in Alberta, we starting to get really long falls. So if you can continue that growing, we sometimes get tremendous weather in August and in September, and then you can take those crops right through the fall. Things that need um, a little bit shorter season are things like lettuce and, and things like radishes. Radishes can be grown in as little as 28 days, if you can believe it. So get those things in, get that second crop growing. Don't give up. Summer's not over yet, even though we're getting these fall questions. It's a good idea to seed something. Go through your seed packet. The very first week we did this, we were going to bring up our little seed box and how we store things by month. And 
that's gone by the way wayside. We've never done that, but that is how I do it. And I've gone through, I've cleaned out, I found some carrots, some seeding, some more beets. So these are all things I put in in the last few days. Okay, that's awesome. I mean, you're saying, where are you getting all that room? Well, I dug out most of my cauliflowers. I dug out a lot of garlic. So I am just making space as I go. And within two weeks, I'll be taking all my peas. They are starting to fade. I know they were so beautiful all year, but they're starting to fade. They were. I've had a lot of those peas. They're delicious. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as we've been talking to Sean, I want to ask you about Sean, because uh, you posted something. We're doing good in the garden this week. And of course, if it's good in the garden, it's good for the planet. And we love talking about bees. And you had a really cool post. I did because Sean shared with me, and you can look on my webpage or on Sean's and find it. Her husband made her. She also has a helpful husband. I really liked that because we always tease my husband, Keith, and call him the helpful husband. Sean has one as well. He took little tree rounds and he made them, you can't tell exactly from the picture, but they're not too thick, little tree rounds. And then he drilled holes through them and he floated them in the water. Because what most people don't realize is that bees get thirsty. Everyone realizes bees need pollen, they need a little bit of nectar, they realize that they need a sheltered spot, but they don't realize they also need a drink and they need a drink every day. Bees do not swim. And if you just have an open pond or an open pool, it's fine if they can go right to the edge and sip up the moisture from the edge. But if they dunk themselves into the pool, the bees will drown. So Sean's husband came up with a really creative idea. He cut some small rounds of wood, he drilled holes into them, and he floated them on some open water. And when you look at that picture on my Facebook page, you were going to be so excited because it's just covered with bees. Now, I tried something a lot more expensive than that, and it didn't work. So I really, really encourage you to follow Sean's husband's advice. I thought that was fantastic. Thanks for sharing. It is. It's awesome. And of course, anything we can do to generate. And mind you, I feel like the bees, the population of bees in our, our garden is massive. I don't know. It, do you feel like they're having a kind of renaissance? Because people were worried about the populations. Well, you know what? They're different in every area. And maybe you've just got a beekeeper in the neighborhood. Oh. Had before, right? And yeah. so bees can travel five kilometers and they maybe have just flown over and noticed that Ian is planting a lot more flowers this year now that he's doing the Facebook lives with Donna is really, he phones me every week and tells me what he's planted. So I know he's doing a lot more flowers, but bees need the flowers. Bees need people to be conscious of not using pesticides, but they also need fungus. So they love yards that have bark mulch down because they can scratch it away. They can get the, the enzymes out of those mycelium. It seems so particular, but bees can do that. But the missing point is often the water and bees need water. And Sean shared that with us this week. So excited. That's awesome, Sean. Thank you so much. She also says uh, she she personal messaged a photo of her uh, clematis just to go back to that previous story. And she says, okay. thanks for talking about the bee floats. Uh, <laughs> what does the picture look like? Uh, well, we'd have to personal have a look at your personal message. And I so don't we'll have follow access. up with that at the end of the show. If there's any more information to know about clematis, we'll let you know after I've looked at Sean's picture. Thank you so much. Also, two other comments about uh, garlic. Uh, Bev also says that she's uh, harvested about 30 bulbs this year. She says somewhere earlier than the other variety been planted. And it was set back by an early spring and then a heavy frost, but it came back. Mm -hmm. Garlic is hard to kill. I actually had it up in my garden in... February and then of course we had snow after that and because I'm on the west coast doesn't mean I'm without frost we had a lot of frost garlic can take snow frost it's really hardy so sometimes the little edges will just get burnt off you get a little bit of burn on the edges but it's great and so keep watering it if it's still green I think that was the upshot from the garlic discussion okay and also good so we got we got to deal with the garlic if the questions about garlic Janine uh Toroski I hope I'm saying your last name right, uh, correctly, Janine. She also says, uh, I still also started using 444 fertilizer on my garlic when planted, made a world of difference to the size. What do you think about that? Yes, uh, it's like blowing up a balloon sometimes though, when you add fertilizer that you don't need, it actually is just, you can actually increase the size of things and it's not as intensely flavored or necessarily as long lasting. And I'm not disputing what you've done, but I, because if you don't do any fertilizing at all, I've also seen the other side of the coin where people get fungus diseases, one called white rot on garlic. So there is um, a correlation with the uh, nutrients in the soil. And I think that's basically why people need to do something. And that's why I do a lot of the organic things like the seed meal. And I like to do things like the kelp. And if you're if you're being successful with the 444, 
that's fine. Go for it. I personally always use the organic fertilizers, but there's a wide range of things that'll work. Just don't want to use too much. We don't use that 20, 20, 20 anymore. It's just too much and it just gives too much growth too fast and the garlic might not be as long lasting through the winter. Okay. And, um, Let's talk about that ant problem because Bev wants to know about it. She oh. says, please talk about your ant solution. <laughs> I have a friend who's having a major problem with them in her lawn. Okay. Because there's lots of different types of ants too, there isn't there? There are so many different types. And so I can't speak to them all. But I will tell you, I was doing a show just like this on CPC Radio in Alberta. And someone phoned me and said that they had used Splenda. Do you know what Splenda is? The sugar the thing? sweetener. Thing. You buy it or steal it from the local coffee shop. And Splenda was recommended. And I talked to an entomologist in quite a bit of detail about this. And there are many kinds of fake sugar, which I didn't realize. But the other thing I didn't realize is that in Splenda in particular, there is chlorine. And chlorine, if you didn't know it, is a real killer of all kinds of things. And that's why it's a common component in in insecticides. So forget about the other kinds of fake sugars, just focus on Splenda, the S-P-L-E-N-D-A. I bought myself a box at the grocery store. I have a crack at the back of my back door. I do literally have a crack where the sidewalk is separating away from the house. And I had so many ants there, it was just an ant parade. So last summer, so this is actually two years ago now, I put some Splenda, just the white powdery, it just looks like sugar, it's very flaky put it in that crack and I have not seen ants in that spot. And I'm not oh. trying to kill all the ants and war in my garden, but that spot right by my house, I wanted to get rid of ants. Now ants play a role. There's a, a role that ants play, but it was a CBC listener that phoned me in Alberta that said, try Splenda. And the entomologist that I spoke with had no idea. He said it wouldn't work. He was talking about, and he sent me some research that's been done on some of the other varieties of, of sugar sweeteners. But the Splenda worked for me. Uh, I suggested it to Heather because she had a planting bed with, um, in her bed she had uh, strawberries and there were so many ants in that bed that the strawberries were dying. So in fact, she did put some Splenda and she had to put it in twice. But I found along, I like to use it just in those little innocuous areas, like where you're not planning on growing anyway, right beside the house. Cause let's face it, if it kills ants, what does it do to you? Well, that's exactly yeah, true. Yeah, sure. Um, Lots of chainsaws in the neighborhood today. I love that though. I like th those are what I call folk solutions. Yeah, well, I know. I mean, it was so funny because I was there answering questions on CBC and it was someone that phoned me. But you know, I, I never discount. Someone else had phoned me in another time and asked me if I would have, if I had ever tried rhubarb leaves to kill ants. And I did try that. It did not work. And someone else phoned and said, try. Um, cornmeal or cream of wheat and I went again marching down to the store and tried these and they did not work for me I'm not saying they won't work for you but the Splenda especially by that crack in my house I'm just amazed two years later I still don't have any ants there I'm a little shocked because I do have friends that use them but I'm amazed <laughs> Bev said the grass should be a lot sweeter too <laughs> <laughs> and that's it exactly I don't know you know grass it's a bigger area, right? You might find those ants have gone down quite a ways in the grass and it might be hard to get to them. And I do know that there's official food tasters. Did you know this in the ant world? They no. have, they post the little food tasters outside so that no bad food gets brought down to the queen. Oh, I did yeah. not know that. Yeah. But I think what happened with my little crack in the sidewalk is that those guys never made it back to the queen, right? They ate it and they died. I don't think I killed the queen. I have no illusion here. Ants are pretty tenacious, but I do know that those particular tasters are gone now. Wow, that's really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you want to do a bit of learning on this segment? And in our learning segment, I want to talk to people about Bobex because uh, I don't think, well, particularly on Vancouver Island, you could never not talk about deer enough. Yes. They're in everybody's garden. They eat everybody's I have plants. a sad story. I saw four of them in somebody's garden on their drive down here today, and I filmed them. Did you? Because I could use a bit of film. Because I've had a little bit of a crisis. Why? Ian and I always meet the night before. We always talk about what's working. And I told him my secret was not to spray the Bobex on the plants because many plants turn black. It's not nice. And food plants in particular, you're not to use Bobex. It's not registered for food plants. Now, I've had the experience where I put manure down and the plants, things like squashes, 
watermelons taste like the manure. They don't taste. So I'm worried about using Bobex on food. And right on the label, it says don't use it on food. But I am desperate. I put watermelons in my front yard. I am growing those watermelons for my grandchildren. I promised them they would have watermelons when they come to visit me this <laughs> summer. It's a hotbed. It's new soil. It should be just perfect. Twice, twice the deer have chewed it back. And that's when I finally started on Bobex. And I just sprayed it around the outside edge because my friend that works for the town said that's how the town, it's just too expensive. A little bottle will cost $40, so they can't spray it on every plant. They just put it around the edge. So last night I had Gordy out for a walk and I checked on my watermelon because I have a watermelon this big, it's so exciting. No problems, we got back from the walk, I sprayed the Bobex around, I spray it every two weeks now. Went to bed, woke up this morning, half, half, my prize watermelon is gone. Oh, oh, no. I know. So we were going to talk about how Bob X is another oh, solution. No. But I'm going back to something that Ian and I talked about about a month ago. But I'm going to bring it up again. That's devastating. I know. I really put, wanted to see that. I know. I'm going to show it to you. You're going to be shocked. Oh. So I'm going to put the cloth back on. I'm going to do that this afternoon. I have uh, Remay, also called Agribond. Right. I also have ProtectNet. I had the ProtectNet on earlier, and I'm going to put that back on because I need to grow a watermelon for my grandkids and I can't move those plants now. They're in my front yard. I've got some watermelons in the backyard. It was just not as hot back there. So the front is the space and I'm going to have to cover them up today. So if you are looking at deer problems, you can try Bobex. I know the town here uses it. I know it does work and my flowers are certainly fine, but I'm going to actually physically, they've gotten a taste for watermelons now. Those deer are back. And that is the thing about deer that people don't understand. They can get a certain flavor that they like and they'll keep coming back to that same spot. So I have to physically cover them and do a barrier. Yeah. I know it wasn't what we talked about. No, no, that no. Is, I see your point though. That is good in the garden for us this time. I think it's just, I'm going to actually, was that good or was that? That's learning. learning. That was learning. I'm going to have to physically, when you have a plant, for instance, a rose, because sometimes people have a prize rose. If those deer are always after that same plant, just get some netting or something and make a physical make a physical barrier. You've got to do it. And I'm going to have to do that this afternoon. And maybe Ian will film me if he's brave and bold enough. And maybe not. Maybe you'll never see it. But I'm going to cover I'm going to film it for sure. I'm going to cover those Nothing guys this afternoon. Nothing happens on this property without it getting filmed. <laughs> it's happening today. Uh, some short snappers D because uh, we're kind of getting there for time, believe it or not. Um, Sarah Gillian Cooper, she says, first year growing veggies, so I need some help. Have tons of cherry tomatoes, yay, but they aren't ripening. They just hang it on the vine, green as ever. Some have even started going bad. What am I doing wrong? What's she doing wrong? Going bad? Look at that. She says she's got tons of them. They're green, but they're not ripening i wonder what kind there are green tomatoes like green zebra tomatoes that you harvest when you're green. i wonder if <laughs> she actually accidentally one. grew the green zebras i'm just saying i mean they're a medium size they're not a teeny tiny tomato tomatoes are a funny funny bunch i have a few tomatoes that have blossom end rot which is just the end going bad they still ripen up but the end goes bad so there's no solution except heat you need as much heat as you can get tomatoes love heat they want heat that's what they need to ripen up so if in fact you did buy a, red, a green variety instead of a red you'll never get it ripened i actually bought a black variety one year and it was black when it was unripe and then it turned red when it ripened and that really confused me because usually when you have a black tomato, you're expecting it to be black when it's ripe. So there's lots of things happening. Maybe you can find your name tag or find out what kind of tomato you grew and let us know for next week. I'd like that. Okay. Um, Connie Kiramoto, I got a question. She's got, a, she, what, what do you think about this gardeners? Prune zucchinis to increase production and it result, and you also can do that. It will prevent powdery mildew and prevent blossom end rot. Well, it won't prevent it, but thanks for that, Connie. Um, it won't prevent it, uh, but thinning it out is always a good idea. If you have accidentally put too much nitrogen and who hasn't with maybe manures, or maybe using seed meals, maybe you've put down too much and the plants get so tight that the bees can't find their way into pollinate. Remember just a few weeks ago, we showed you how you can get in there yourself with a paintbrush if you're getting those problems like powdery mildew or if you're getting blossom and rot, but you if you don't want to pollinate yourselves and you do instead want to go in and thin out plants, it certainly doesn't hurt them. There are lots of great videos online. I thought about 
maybe next year we'll do that. But I thought about us doing a video like that, but the deer have been thinning out mine so much that I have nothing to thin. So I, it won't hurt. Don't ever take more than sort of half the leaves and start with the ones that are crossing and make sure that you're leaving just, it just adds more air and it lets the plants um, grow a little, a little more breathing space and it will help the bees find the flowers so that you don't have to do that pollination. And that's it. We're there, Dee. That's all for this week. You can maybe mention your blog. You're going to be on okay. Friday. Okay, great. Well, right. I... I keep adding to my blog. People don't realize this, but my web person just told me when you do Google garden blogs, best garden blogs, I am number five in the world. Number six is the guardian. Isn't that amazing? Number six is the guardian. You're ahead of the guardian. Ahead of the guardian. So there you go. Maybe you don't even know what the guardian is, but it's a newspaper uh, in England and it's a famous newspaper. So yep. my gardening blog. So look it up, DonnaBalzer.com. I would love to have you follow my page. I send out a newsletter once a month and the next one's coming out in August with all my little tips and tricks. So if you want to go in, look up DonnaBalzer.com. Love to see you there. And I'm always adding something new. And I'm number five in the world, just ahead of the Guardian. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's great. It's coming together. It's absolutely true. You are number five uh, in the position right now. That's awesome. And also your website has won an award. So we're kind of rolling. I know. We're winning awards. So thank you so much for joining us. And we'll catch you next Monday. That's right. We will. Bye. <laughs>